Queensland Raceway is 55 kilometres southwest of Brisbane. This is the seventh time the V8 supercars will have raced here, mostly over a double driver 500 kilometre format. Today, back to single pilot, 300 kilometres. That raises a few questions about fatigue or wear and tear on both man and machine. 32 starters, 96 laps. They must complete 72 of those before the race can be declared. Back to two compulsory pit stops for tyres and fuel. Mostly fine today, a possible shower. That's always possible here at Willowbank. And a maximum temperature of 22 degrees. A fantastic crowd, both Ford and Holden pouring in. They've been here all morning. Take a look at the championship points after round six. Not much has changed at the top. Jason Bright still leads the championship without winning a race or a round. That's the reward for consistency. And we talk about the edge. Overall, Holden has the edge. They've got six races so far. They lead 4-2, but in poles, well, Ford has five poles after Marcus Ambrose did it again. His third of the season, his third straight at Queensland Raceway. We welcome Neil Crompton once again as we take a look at the track map, a 3.12 kilometre circuit. Afternoon, Matthew, and this track may look simple. I can assure you it is not. Very difficult to set up for six turns with a top speed of 250 kilometres per hour. Relatively smooth except for a couple of places in turns one and turn six. Lap record held by Garth Tander, qualifying record by John Bow, and the man that takes us for the best backseat drive of this racetrack is Holden Racing Team's Mark Scaife for the hot seat. Lining up to start a lap, there's the control tower. On the left, over the bumps, down to fourth. On the rumble strip on the exit of one. A little bit of break, watching for turning over steer. Corner goes on and on forever. The drivers want to get on with the throttle, the car won't do it. Fourth, fifth and briefly sixth gear. 250 k's, hard on the brakes, couple of little pitter patter bumps, then a biggie. Down to second. Break and trail break all the way into the middle of the corner. Can't afford to have oversteer on the exit. It's the left rear tyre that gets punished around this track. Braking marker on the right on the approach to four. Down to second gear again. Up to third for turn five. Drivers always want to crack the throttle and it's hard to do that around this track. Third, fourth and fifth gear on the approach to turn six. Back to second gear, no messing around with shift by shift. Car beautifully on line, right on the white line, gets its power to the road. And that is a lap from Mark Scape, who has recorded the fastest lap of the week so far at a 10-3. Marcus Ambrose, as we take a look at the starting grid of our full 32 competitors, will lead us off. Scape second, Morris third. That's his best qualifying performance of the year. Russell Ingle in fourth. Then it's Simon Wills, Jason Bright, Greg Murphy, Todd Kelly, John Bow and Paul Radisic rounded out our top 10. And good to see David Bernard finally with a VA Falcon completing a set of three for Ford Performance Racing. He's looking forward to performing well in this new car. Down to Rick Kelly there and we move through to see Stephen Ellery in 17th and Max Wilson in 18th. Who's having problems starting his car on the grid at the moment. And Garth Pander with diabolical handling issues with the Valvoline Cummins entry this weekend. Car 34 down in position 19. Mark Larkham in 20 and in position 21 is his teammate Jason Barguana. Barguana will be the last man in an AU for the Orcon Racing Team this weekend. I should say he's got a BA coming for Oren Park. And we move to the rear of the field. You heard Daryl Beattie talk about the positioning of Stephen Richards. He's not on that page, he's on the next one. 29th, quite clearly his worst qualifying performance of the season. He's been in four out of the seven shootouts, but not this one. David Thexton qualified here. He'll be our 32nd starter. So, crystal clear conditions and it's single file around turns four, five, and then finally six. And you can just feel it starting to build up, especially between the blue and red corners of Ambrose and Scaife. Stephen Ellery will be on board with him for the super cheap autos car. Richards, well, he's got to be favorite for the hard charger award for today if he can mow his way through the field. We know he's got the race pace. We know he's got the smarts about him. He's got a whole lot of experience starting from way back there. Greg Murphy, yet again, they've had their troubles off the track. We'll talk a little bit more about that as the race moves on. Stephen Johnson, the Shell Helix Racing number 17. Remember that victory 
that Junior Johnson had here with Paul Radisic back in 2001 when it was all settled in the ditch in the rain. Hopefully we won't get a repeat of that. One of the big questions here is fatigue and how the drivers will cope with 300 kilometres. I know for one that Russell Ingle has predicted mayhem and already we can predict a little bit of trouble for Max Wilson. He's been forced to come in. He'll start from pit lane, but not yet, because we're about to get underway for the Big Pong 300. Scape against Ambrose. They resume rivalries at the front of the grid, and they're going 3-4 wide mid-pack down to turn one with a big bump. Is it already a bump between the red and the blue? Scape and Ambrose contact into turn one. And Bow got a shocking start and had his ears boxed in the early couple of metres at the start of that race. But Scaife draws first blood and gets to the first corner first, and that's an important blow for him. Around turn two they go. A couple will go wide and just dip into the dirt on the left-hand side. Up to 250 kilometres down the back straight. This is the tricky corner, turn three. There's a lot of bumps on the entry into turn three, and quite a few people go spearing off there throughout these races, and we've already seen it in practice and qualifying. Up to turn four and five. Richards opting to go around the outside of people as they bunch up down there at turn three, which is a smart move in the early part of the race. He'll make some ground out of all that. Rick Kelly battling with Craig Lowndes. It's a long way, 300 kilometres, the Big Pond 300, on a track notoriously tough on the left rear tyre. Turn six completed for Scaife and Ambrose. The top ten goes through. A big puff of smoke out the back of the Stone Brothers racing duet of Ambrose and Ingle. A standing lap, 117.605 for Mark Scape. We'll let them go past and check out the race order after our first lap of 96 for the Big Pond 300. There's your Shell Helix race update as Greg Murphy goes on the inside and smoke. Oh, that could have been disastrous. But Greg Murphy manages to hold on to his position and he gets past Paul Radisic. He's just uh, locked up a little on the way into two. That's made him vulnerable now for Lowndes, who's up on the outside. And if he can get far enough up, he can take the ground off the other guy on the exit. But Paul hangs on. You do not want to be wide out there where Bernard is at the moment because of the amount of rubber build-up and dust on the edge of the road. It's very hard to get front grip in the front of the car. So Scaife, Ambrose, Ingle, Morris, Bright, Wills were your top six as they crossed the line. You saw the battle between Murphy, who slipped sliding around. Let's check it out from the start and watch this for contact between Scaife and Ambrose. There's a little touch right there. It almost derailed Mark Scaife completely. Ambrose held his nerve and held his line and got through in second position. This is the view from Russell Engel's car. You see Mark coming across, he got the better jump and he was determined to get to the race line by the time they got down to the inside at one. A little bit of biff and barge, but he had plenty of car in front and he was able to get away with it. It was interesting looking in the background of the previous replay shot. We saw that Bow actually was all four wheels in the grass at the start. Darrell? Well, Max Wessel, frustrating times for him. The team had to push start him at the start of that warm-up, Neil. It wouldn't start with the key, so the official said, bring him in. We want to see this car start with the key. So now the mechanic's working on it, trying to get it to start. So some sort of a starter motor issue has still got that car in pit lane and that means that the rest of the day is done basically for Max. He may get out there, but he's not going to be a factor at all with two laps already booked in this race. And that's two strikes for Max Wilson here at Queensland Raceway. He qualified sixth here last year, but didn't finish. Ooh. Simon Wills now, Todd Kelly all caught up in this bunch. And look who's there as well, Greg Murphy. Wills gets the rears right out heavy on that turn. And Todd Kelly is not letting go. Oh, Murphy's going to take an advantage here because Todd found himself on the wrong side of the road when they went up to turn six, and so Murphy grabs a spot. Wills was really battling in turn four. He had the thing all crossed up and sideways. And it's just weird sometimes how luck of the draw can have you in the wrong spot at the right time, or conversely, it can occasionally work for you when weird things happen when the pack is so tightly bunched. 1-11-8, the fastest man on the road so far for Russell Ingle. 11 9 apiece for Scape and Ambrose. So Ingle's running with them. Morris a good start in fourth, then Jason Bright, and then this battle here as Murphy now is ideally positioned to get up the inside if he's strong enough under brakes, and he is. And that'll take Greg Murphy up to sixth position. Oh. Contact between Murphy and Team Dynamic. Wills goes off. David Bernard almost fires him deep, heavy into brakes at turn three. Hard to work out what exactly occurred then between Wills and Murphy. 
it looked like a clean pass, but maybe Murphy understeered wide under brakes at the end of that stop. And now we'll uh, get another view of it. Here it is, Strathfield replay. So what happens here? Ah, Greg gets crossed up. He locked the rear brakes, and as he applied the opposite lock to the steering, it carted him into the path of Wills, who then got dragged out into the dirty part of the track and then went further wide off onto the grass. A 111.7012 now belongs the fastest lap to Mark Scaife. So Ingalls' time there on lap three has just been erased by Mark Scaife, who leads him out from Ambrose. Ingle, Morris, Bright, Todd Kelly, there he goes. Then it's Paul Radisic and Craig Lowndes in eighth position after just missing out on the shootout. He qualified 11, missed out on the shootout, and now he's starting to work his way up through the field. It takes a couple of laps to normalise the tyre pressures and the tyre temperatures. And so we'll start to see people now getting into a rhythm. Got through the initial hurly-burly in the first couple of laps where everybody argues over there in the square inch of real estate. And then you can draw a breath and say, OK, where am I? What now? How do I get into a rhythm? How do I look after the rear tyre? It's not so much where that's the problem here, Matthew. It's just overheating it, working it too hard, expecting too much from it. And if your car's weak, in other areas, in particular with turn, as the pit window is now open and uh, Max Wilson's mobile, which is good news for the Shell team. The problem is that you tend to want to stand on the gas to try and make up for your deficiencies by being quicker on the exit of the corners. And of course, it does the rear tyre no favour at all. Another lap down, 11.4 now for Mark Scaife. So he's lowering the times lap by lap. We had a shot there before of Garth Tander who is now in 11th position, so he's climbed up eight from the start. We're probably going to see some pretty speedy race times here. We've got a little bit more cloud cover today than we've had in the last couple of days out here. It's beautiful weather in southeastern Queensland. And considering the stage of the race that we're at, it's a pretty smart times. 11-4, as you said, for Scaife. 11-6 for Ambrose. 11-7 for this man, Russell Ingle. Morris is just drifting a little bit now. 11-9. getting an idea from these onboard shots of just the lumps and bumps in the road here, which are growing year on year. There's a few more bumps on the approach to turns one and six. A little bit bumpier into turn four now as well. This is the approach to six. See the little ripples in the road? You can see where tyres have locked up and just stuttered across the road there and lift little marks. It's the margin first to second, second to third. Bright's got a good watching brief going there. No pressure for him at the moment. There's the brand new VY Commodore with the Holden Motorsport engine aboard for Paul Morris, who couldn't be happier with the performance of this car, even though they've had their hiccups throughout the weekend. Morris went spearing off twice in the warm-up this morning, and as Rusty mentioned, had a broken clutch plate throughout the shootout, which he managed to finish in third position. The reason why they didn't fix it was, A, they didn't really know what it was. They probably didn't have enough time. Now they've fixed it, ready for race. And Paul Morris is in fourth position behind him. This man, Jason Bright. Car number five, who qualified seventh. Made it up to sixth in the shootout and currently fifth now. He was a little bit unhappy with his car in qualifying and uh, said that uh, broke loose on him in the shootout in a couple of spots when he didn't want it to, but he thought it was a terrific race car and had very good consistency. And one of the things that Jason Bright is hopeful of is that uh, hopefully now that these franchise agreements have been sorted out between the various key players, they're going to be able to get on with their testing program, which they've not been able to do during the year with the Team Brock cars. So our PlayStation 2 race score shows you that from the word go, Mark Scaife took the jump on Marcus Ambrose, Ingle holding down third, Morris, Jason Bright, Todd Kelly through to sixth, Radisic in seventh, Lowndes in eighth, Murphy's in ninth, and John Bow is in tenth position. One of the real secrets to success at this racetrack is obviously crunching out a decent number for qualifying and shootout, Matthew, but it's very difficult sometimes to get the ideal race set up in order to maintain some pace and longevity in the car. And in search of that this weekend, Todd Kelly and Matthew Crawford, who engineers the car, have done a lot of work to try and 
looked for the ideal performance out of the car and they changed it quite heavily again prior to the shootout. They figured that the shootout was their last chance to make a reasonable assessment to see whether they could get a better race car. And Con uh, Todd was reasonably confident that he had a car that was a pretty good jigger to be able to fight with through the race. Seaton's in. Remember the pit window opened on lap two. So Glenn Seaton decides to come in on lap 13. By the way, HRT expect to have their second new car, the sister car. Oh, that's oh, a problem. Seaton, that's a big problem. He's gone straight in and parked it. And we understand that he slowed on the track. I think Greg Rust has gone straight down there to check it out. Goods up for Cito. As the FPR guys go to work, Rusty. Just, just trying to find out what's going on here, guys. The bonnet is up. Glenn's endeavouring to restart it. So we'll try and have a word to John Matthews down here. We'll come back to in a second. OK, mate, we'll check in with you ASAP. I was just going to mention that HRT car will be ready by Sandown, the other car. So they'll have two brand new spankers and the options they're considering. This is the battle for ninth and 10th. John Bow, if you recall, was uh, all over the shop at the start there. I couldn't see who, exactly who was doing what to who, but he was out in the grass and he managed to climb back on. And he's progressing pretty reasonably at the moment. He's torturing the back of Greg. And their last laps were 12.6 and 12.7, respectively. But by comparison, Scape and Ambrose, 11.4 and 11.6. And this is the problem all weekend for everybody other than really Marcus and, and Mark. They've, they've had tremendous speed from themselves and their two cars and everybody else has been scratching their head looking to try and close that uh, deficit. John Bow's been top five here at Queensland twice. And Greg Murphy, who's now really under attack he's been on the podium here twice third in 2000 and 2001 but remember last year the heartbreak when they ran out of fuel and that problem with the pickup and that was the end of greg murphy's day it was just one of those days for murph and the kmart commodore team qualified seventh murph comes off the back of a fourth placing at Hidden Valley. He's fourth in the championship compared to John Bow's 18th standing. We check out Paul Radisic and Craig Lowndes. Radisic is trying to tag onto the back of Todd Kelly for sixth place. So what you're looking at there is seventh and eighth. Both those teams have had pretty successful tests in between Darwin and now. So both Radisic and Lowndes getting plenty of valuable mileage. Obviously, Radisich being a Queensland-based team, as Richards now comes in, doing miles here at Queensland Raceway, which puts him in the box seat for this track and uh, full performance racing down at Phillip Island. And the Castrol team tested this car. Okay, guys, have finished the rear wheels. Put the go-jacks on again. Just wait Two weeks ago at Winton, 120 laps. Tire change, Daryl Beatty. Well, Stephen Richards in tyre change, everything going as normal here. I watched the team before he came in, they were friendly talking about changing alternators and other things as well, so we'll wait and see what happens. They did make reference then, I heard them talk about the go jacks. If you've got the go jacks out in the middle of the race, you're about to swing the car into its bunker, so, and that's what they're doing. You can see just at the rear of the car there, they've got them positioned. They enable the crews to manoeuvre the car in its own length, and uh, any time you wheel those out, within a race that means there's something fairly serious going on and Richo's unbuckling game over for Stephen Richards for the big pond 300 for now at least so this weekend just starts to slide further and further away for Castrol Perkins racing Radio reference you just heard then once it's actually into the pit lane bunker as distinct from the working part of the lane where there's rest restriction on the number of people that can work on the car you can throw any amount of people on it, on it in there so whatever their problem is they can now dive in. John Bowers finally got Greg Murphy so Bow moves up to position nine and Murph slots back to ten. He worked on him and worked on him and worked on him and he finally got him probably at turn three I would say yes it is on the inside a lock up and a bit of paint swapping maybe he did it the hard way but he got there in the end pretty good tight driving between both of them john made the lunge greg recognized it left a bit of space bowie had a little bit of dust going on the inside and in the end i don't think they actually did manage to touch which was good 
hard motor racing between a couple of blokes who've done a lot of kilometres. Haven't they? What? 166 championship starts for John Bow. 70 for Greg Murphy behind him. Michelle Helix race update continues to have Mark Scaife out the front. You see there now that John Bow has taken over that spot from Greg Murphy. Tanner in 11th, Wills in 12th. Down to 20th where Cameron McConville is. Let's check in on what happened with Glenn Seaton. More from Greg Rust. Well, Matty, the Gojacks are out for that car and it is being wheeled behind pit lane here. What happened, Cito? They just come out of turn five and then the engine just automatically um, just cut out. So looks like it's done something electrical. I think it's the crank trigger on the front of the, the uh, crank. It's actually knocked it off. Um, and that's the end of our day. That's heartbreak for you because it looked ominous here this weekend. FPR with their three brand new BAs. Things have been going reasonably well for you. Yeah, pretty good. I, off the start line, I had a really bad slipping clutch, so I had to cool it down for a couple of laps. But once that come good, the car was OK. It was um, circulating around. It's just a shame that these things happen. But they do happen. It's motor racing. Hard luck, Len. Glenn sticking around in Queensland for the next few days. He's going to go for a blast. His dad is actually, Barry Seaton has rebuilt an old Group C Ford Capri. Oh. And he's going to hang around and have a blast in that. He said to me this afternoon that it'll be great, but I'll go for a slide. And I'm really looking forward to it. So that'll put a smile on his face and perhaps overcome the pain of this afternoon. I reckon you're right. 15, car number 15 is in 14th place. And that is young Rick Kelly. And behind him is David Bernard. Seaton's teammate out of Ford Performance Racing. Rusty mentioned that finally got all three BAs online at FPR, which we all know was only pieced together at the start of the season and it hasn't gone Glenn Seaton's way today. It also hasn't gone well at Castrol Perkins Racing. Maybe Larry Perkins can explain it a bit more to Daryl. Larry, this is not what you want to see. It's been a bad weekend so far. What's going on? Yeah, it is a bad weekend. Uh, well, the alternator stopped charging on the outlap, you know, for the start of the race before we even got to the grid. and. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't know why it stopped charging, but it did, and we were just uh, we had to press on and get the start done and um, you know, go to the battery vaults. We no longer run the car now, we're changing the alternator. Had an engine problem yesterday and another niggly thing carrying on now. Yes, he uh, started well back as the uh, engine failed right at, right at the uh, qualifying lap, which didn't help, and uh, yeah, so it hasn't been a good weekend. Thanks, Larry. Just to add some comment to that as we watch this vigorous battle, um, what Larry's talking about there, without the alternator sending uh, the required charge, it's just going to drain whatever power you've got left in the battery. So ultimately, they just sucked all the energy out of the battery, and that was what forced the stop at the end. Now they'll change that alternator. Mark Scape is the leader of the Big Pond 300. Marcus Ambrose still maintaining the rage, eight tenths of a second behind. Smoke from BJ's car, so. Ugh, big smoke. And, then... and that is going to probably be terminal in the end because you heard Kim Jones telling Rusty, look, look at Jason Richards. He's dropping oil on the track and leaving behind a trail of disaster for the guys behind him. All sorts of talk over the team radios and they're trying to get Bradley to hit that switch to the top position. They're blowing about some one of the switches in it somewhere. The diff pump switch. So they're trailing it to switch the diff pump on. And when it's heaving oil and it's got that sort of temperature like it has at the moment, then it's going to be a drama and no amount of putting a switch on, I think, is going to rectify that. That's Kim on, that's Kim on the radio. That's Bradley calmly answering. <laughs> Well, they couldn't hear each other going down that back straight, down to turn three. And it hasn't been a good weekend for Bradley. It's just the car has not responded. You can see the oil trail on the bumper. So Brad Jones comes in now. and well, That smoke stopped pouring out for now. The Aussie Mail team calls him in. Where it's been awkward for him this weekend is they, they don't get the same read out of this car that they do out of John's car, and it forces them to take a different approach to the setup on the vehicle. And they're just a little bit lost with it at the moment. Doesn't sound too healthy with a broken header. Sounds like an old Massey Ferguson tractor in the pit lane there at the moment. Let's see where the rear roll centre is on that thing if we can stay <laughs> out of there for long enough. We might be able to help him. 
give him some setup tips, you reckon, Matty? Well, I know Rusty's standing by to possibly. Yeah, you're there. Have a chat to Bradley. Well, sure am, guys. Just down here with Bradley. You're, uh, you're pretty dejected right now. Just describe what's happened here. Uh, well, we, the exhaust broke at the start and, uh, and it burnt, the fumes have burnt through a, uh, an oil line, so. Not a great weekend, Rusty. You're, uh, you're, you're rubbing your eyes. It's quite a, like a noxious smell in the car. How hard is it from a driver's point of view when it's coming inside the cabin like that? Uh, it's quite unbearable. To tell you the truth, it's terrible. So as you can see, I'm all water, but it'll be OK. He's away. They're going to stick it in the garage here in the background. So You heard Kim on the radio earlier talking about the fact that the, they had the broken header and then that... Uh, that means you can get concentrated exhaust gas in various areas, depending on where it actually occurred in the header. And that can have a pretty ill effect on some of the other gear immediately around it. The temperatures in you know, under bonnet are generally pretty astonishing anyway. Check the state of play at the moment. You can see on your race score there as we go down to 15th, David Bernard, Stephen Johnson, Barguala. Back up the front, Mark Scaife and Marcus Ambrose. The gap is now 2.3 seconds between Scaife and Ambrose. So Scaife has... Just been putting down a few more impressive lap times than the man behind him. Russell Ingle is still in third and Paul Morris in car 29 is in the hunt for first top five finish for the season. The best he's done so far in 2003, a tenth at Eastern Creek. We've got Glenn Seaton now in the commentary box with us. Have a chat to Cito. We understand what your problem was, Cito. And you... I mean, I've heard you say it before. It's just, <laughs> it's just the way of the world in this game, isn't it? Yeah, thanks, Matty. Um... It is that way. I actually haven't had a very good record. A bit like Crombo. I haven't had much of a record here in Queensland. But, um, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's surprising, really. Like, off the start line, um, my clutch was slipping really bad, so I had to shut it down for a couple of laps to try and get the temperature out of it. And um, and uh, that's why we lost quite a lot of spots. But uh, what's happened is coming out of just where um, Kanto just came out now, turn uh, five, um, it's just all of a sudden just shut down and what's happened is um, somehow it's knocked the crank trigger off the front of the engine which fires the sparks to make the engine go so um, it's not driver abuse is it <laughs> it's pretty hard it's pretty hard to uh, blame the driver for the crank trigger falling off <laughs> that's one safe thing they can't say it's my fault this weekend you can say hey it wasn't my department yeah. the uh, fatigue that we're talking about we just take a look here at 66 which is Dean Canto in 13th position and Rick Kelly is behind him in 14th. This fatigue that we've just been speaking about, especially when you've got a situation like Bradley where he's got fumes coming through the car. You didn't put down a whole stack of laps in that race, unfortunately. And, you, you know, you're quite red in the face. You look a little bit spent. 300 k's a long way around here. Matty, it? it's... Whoops, there you go. Oh, was something wrong with Bezzy's car? Or has he just gone late under brake? I think he's just, going again. Yeah, he just got out in the marbles, I think, so. Um, I think, Matty, it's probably my age at the end of the day. I'll probably show, show the heat a bit more. But, uh, no, um, it's, they're, they're quite demanding cars to drive. And naturally, the, f the fumes in the cars are probably the most difficult part to get used to. And um, Neil can really vouch for this. And probably, really, Bathurst is probably the worst place we go to for fumes. And you usually get out after the first stint and think, Jesus, I feel like I've done the 1,000 Ks already after one stint. So the fumes is the big critical factor in these cars. And most of us now use these filtering systems, but you still can't get over the top of that carbon monoxide poisoning, which um, really gets into your bloodstream from the, uh, from the petrol fumes. The look of David Bernard's new car, he said to me at the start of the week, now I've got a BA, I've got no excuses. What's your take on the look of it? The feel. I think I think they're great. We're, naturally, we've still got a, a way to go with our speed. Um, naturally, to, to have the three cars within a tenth of each other in qualifying is fantastic. Um, but uh, the cars just need that more edge in qualifying to get into the top ten and, and probably more to the front. So it's going to take a bit more time. But uh, at this stage, um, I'm reasonably happy with the way we're going. We've got some new stuff coming in the in the future, new engines um, from uh, ProDrive and that. So um, I, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And you, you guys were really, uh, it, it was knife edge, wasn't it? You could have been in the top 10 had the ball bounced the other way because we looked yesterday, one stage in qualifying, position four was on a 10.8, I think, and position 11 was on a 10.8 or a 10.9. So we're talking about slices in the realm of hundreds of seconds. So you, it, it's always difficult to explain to the audience just how close it is, Glenn. It is exactly right, Neil. And like at the end of the day, you, you go around that track and you're on the edge everywhere you're going qualifying. You think to yourself when you come back to the pits, where the hell could I gain that extra tenth just to make the top ten? And and like you're on the edge in the braking areas, which you know, you've been there. Um, and, and sometimes 
sometimes uh, people, when you say, oh, we've qualified 12, they think that you're, uh, you're not on you're the pace, asleep. but you're actually only two and three tenths off the pace. <laughs> we thank Len Seaton for coming up. Hope you enjoy a uh, bit of fun while you stay up here in <laughs> Queensland. We got the job done. The total time loss for a fuel stop here. Oh, oh that's Canto. Dean Canto off a turn three, 360, and David Bernard just misses out on a wing in the face. Oh. You know how that happened, he picked the throttle up as the thing was rotating in an effort to try and catch it, and it almost ended in tears with him making contact with David. I was going to say, the danger at Queensland Raceway is that the total time loss from pit in, the fuel stop and pit out can be 55 to 60 seconds, and if you're more than 12 seconds behind the leader, you obviously go a lap down, so if you... Uh, Go a lap down, it can be bad news. Here's the replay, and he just gets out in the grey, runs that, out of lock. That was but stage it, one of that, and that is stage two. Wow, that's close. They have very little in the way of steering lock available. <laughs> he gets back on and thinks, how on earth did I get out of that? It's back good. markers for Mark Scaife, that's Anthony Tratt. Now, Mark Scaife, by the way, is now clawing further and further ahead of Marcus Ambrose. Scaife, 3.3 seconds clear now of car number four. And you can see in between them is two other cars. And just in the last couple of laps, Mark has Great made a little bit of a margin out of the traffic. And I've just seen a couple of shots of Marcus sliding around here and there. And uh, so he's just slid the back of the car a little bit more on the exit of three and six. There's the margin. Daryl, what can you add? Yeah, Neil, HRT starting to talk about a stop, and especially now Mark is starting to get into lap traffic. They feel that they don't want to lose time and let Marcus close that gap once they get into this traffic. Eventually, it's going to be ahead of him very shortly, so there could be a stop coming soon. And DB, just as you were talking, the shot of Marcus going through one then was the car in a complete drift all the way through, so the rear tyres are just starting to get a little bit hot and sad for the Pertec car. Not overly affecting lap speed, because both of them last time through 12-5, but certainly beginning to impact on the balance of the car. And a 12-5 incidentally plays sort of high 12s for everybody else. Morris Bright, Kelly Lowndes, Bow actually on the last lap of 12-3. So that's pretty handsome. Speaking of handsome. This is where you're talking about, Neil, back to turn one. Look yeah. at that. Sliding all the way over to the left-hand side of the circuit. And it was a repeat performance at turn two. When you said handsome, you're talking to me or Brad no, Jones? I was, I was about to say that replay <laughs> saved me from the, what was the next obvious silly thing to say, which was uh, welcome, Brad Jones. <laughs> well, thanks, Bromley. It's uh, fantastic to be here amongst two absolute professionals of the uh, of the job. I Brad, knew you'd be thrilled. Brad, you've got the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I thought I was in with Barry doing circuit commentary. Yeah, that was, uh, that was tough, wasn't it? I mean, we saw you when you were being interviewed by Rusty down there and the eyes were starting to water, not only the frustration, but... Oh, I thought you were going to cry. Sick feeling. feeling. I was crying. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, the exhaust was broken, so it's pretty, uh, pretty gassy, and there's a bit of action. Oh, oh Dumbrell versus Larkham, and Dumbrell comes off worse for wear into the dirt. And now has to get it back onto the track, which he does so. And it was a case of take no prisoners there from Mark Larkham as he came through on the inside of turn five. And that was. Battle for 19th and 18th position. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Get out of my way. I think McConville's actually made a nice little gain out of that as well. So as Paul was out in the grass, he was able to make a couple of extra metres. Here's another view of it. Well, Larko was certainly well and truly up the side there. And uh, two into one doesn't go. It doesn't take much to bump one of these things off the road. And Paul Dumbrill skates clear. He drops a couple of spots. It doesn't look like there's any sustained damage, which is good. And Cameron McConville's done the take on Mark Larkham there as well so in between us seeing that live and then the replays Cameron has slipped up on the in or out of Mark Larkham and taken that position off him. 19th and 20th these guys and uh, all that little biff and barge session that last lap of theirs was a 15-7. lock up for Cameron McConville at the same point where Larkham and Dumbrell they had toe to toe. They had some brake balance dramas with this thing yesterday that uh, had Cameron off the road at one point. And uh, it hasn't been a great weekend for them. They had a really good test at Eastern Creek last week. And this is the frustration of V8 supercar racing as Larkham now peels off for his CPS. And they thought that they had a, a better handle on the car in preparation for this event, but it hasn't really translated. So, that, you know, Queensland Raceway, as Bradley will fully attest, 
is a very strange place. It looks very simple on paper, six corners, but it's a nightmare, isn't it, BJ? Absolute Just absolute nightmare, because what happens is you can get a little bit tarly through one and two, and then we'll push understeer all through the middle section. So then you trim your car up and you make it with a little tiny bit understeer through one and two, and it's undrivable through the middle section. It's so like you can fix either half, but fixing the whole circuit is a real nightmare. Exactly. And the point we're at to in the race now is everyone's tyres are getting a little bit worn. They're all trying to drive straight. But what's really happening here is um, everyone's playing, let's wait and see what the leaders do. Because it's such a, a short circuit, you're not wanting to go a lap down. There's Stevie Richards climbing out of his car. He had two bites at the cherry, Stephen Richards, and I'd say now that is game set and match for Richo on lap 40 of 96. Cameron McConville in 1999 had his first ever podium finish here in the Queensland 500. He's been suffering the flu for the last week or so, and he joins a long list in the driver department for that kind of activity. Paul Morris has been pretty crook as well. Oh, Stephen Richards has jumped back in. He refuses to lay down, and now they're pushing the Castrol car number 11 back out for another crack. That's it. I'm sick of writing him off. Yeah, because once he was out the second time, I thought that was it. I was sort of hoping he'd stay, because if you finish in the top 30, you get your appearance money if you're outside the top 30. <laughs> you don't. He's just knocked me off on 31st, so I get nothing. That's the story of my life, really. <laughs> the bumps on this circuit, Bradley... Uh, quite a few of them and the general consensus is they, they're getting worse. Oh, they're definitely getting worse. Into one and uh, three, they're quite bad. There's quite a significant dip on the way down into three and you've almost got to ease off your brake a little bit and then get back on it to uh, to get the car to pull up there and you're doing, you know, 250 k's. You look at them bounce over those bumps there, trying to get the right amount of rebound in the car so it rides those bumps nicely and doesn't skip across the top. It's half the trick to going fast around here. And BJ, when you're on the approach to one, I know last year it, it would almost bounce your feet out of the pedal box. Is it like that this year when you go for the brake pedal? Absolutely. It's uh, Here we go. We've got Kelly in here. What's he going to go for? Fuel. Which is really interesting because I would have sworn most of them would go for their tyres first, but a lot of them are tending to top the things up with fuel, which is a longer stop. Personally, I would have waited and gone for the fuel in case there was a safety car later on the race. As Todd Kelly comes in, that battle between Craig Lowndes go, and go, 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 go. Sean Bow is a battle between two very good movers. Here's Cameron McConville also getting juice on board. John Bow started in ninth. He's moved up to sixth. And Lowndes okay, go. started in 11th as he's moved up to seventh. Ingalls in. Russell comes in for Stone Brothers in front of Cameron McConville, who is now exiting pit lane. And now is a dangerous time of the race because those people that have actually come in, most of them have gone a lap down. They're on good tyres or they've got a tank full of juice. It's a danger period for those people because anybody can slip off the road, get a pace car, boom, you're a lap down and you'll stay that way for the majority of the race. So it's a really tricky time, this part of the race. Never comfortable if you're one of the first ones to pit. And you also get a mishmash of performance between different vehicles. Suddenly a car that earlier in the race had a certain level of performance, gets a new set of boots on while you've got an old set and you've got different guys at different speed levels, which is why it often ends up in a brawl at this stage of the race. And as Bradley said, you get the cars off the road in the pace car. And you heard Campbell Little there from Stone Brothers Racing, just letting the enforcer know that he had a clear track exit so he could come barreling out. We understand that Mark Scape is getting the call to come in. Paul Morris has already got his. They're having a look under there while they just do a fuel stop at the rear. You can see head down, nozzles in. Once these leaders have come in, you'll find them drop like nine pins. They'll all start to come in. And you will see in pit lane as one of the Valvoline cars comes in as well. Scape is about to come in as well. We understand for fuel, Marcus Ambrose is going to come in for tyres and Anthony Tratt needs to get himself onto yes. the right. You can't spend too long in that working lane because, or that manoeuvring lane, or that you'll uh, copper a, a drive-through penalty very quickly. You must yield now to the driver in the fast lane. His scape, we understand, he's coming in. Yep. Now this is the guy that literally has been... Pretty much the... Mark, mark, do not want to do the, the uh, roll centre or do you reckon wings better? Should hear the answer, or maybe they're going to keep that quiet. Robbie, when you go back out like now, it'll use much traveller. When the tyres are fresh, it'll be, it'll be too understeering, probably. So, sort of caught in the middle there. I reckon just come out on the rear pressure to frag. 
So he's suggesting he just drops the rear tire pressure. Get a guy and then come off, so let's just make a decision. Now, this is the way it's been all weekend. Scape versus Ambrose. And the interesting thing is here, one's going for tyres, one's going for fuel. So Ambrose will be the fastest car when they get back on the track. Scape will be holding, hoping he can hold him up because when he gets his tyres on later in the race, he'll be off. And right now, oh, Marcus stopped. Ambrose gets out ahead. Of course, he only did tyres. Remember, that Scape is still taking fuel on board. It's always going to be go, a longer stop. Go, 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 now go, he's clear go. to go. And what he was talking about before was just repressuring the next set of tyres that have come on the car and just taking a whisker out of the rears. And the thing is, to change the roll centre or the rear wing, when you put the fuel in it, you've got 30 seconds. It's plenty of time to do it. When you just do the tyres, you've got six or seven seconds. It needs to be a fast change, and so you don't have a lot of time to react. Now's the time to take a look at the times of Marcus Ambrose, now that he's got fresh rubber on. So Lowndes has completed his pit stop as well. So too is Greg Murphy and also Jason Bargwana. We understand that there's more dramas for car number 11. Stephen Richards has received a black flag for pit lane speed. If things go against you, they come down in buckets in this sport. Mark Noski coming flying down the main straight. Greg Murphy gets back out and rejoins the race. And here comes Bradley's teammate, Johnny Bow. Well, I was hoping he'd come in because he's racing with Lowndes. Lowndes, Lowndes stopped the, the lap earlier. He needs to get in, get his tyres on if that's what he's going to do, and get out in front of him while Lowndes is getting a bit of heat in his tyres, try and hold him up so then he can make the pass because they were close. It's a pretty good run so sure. far from JB Bradley. He's, um, you probably didn't see it or you may have spotted it, but he was in the grass on the way down to turn one at the start of the race and he was out in the weeds all crossed up like a sprint car, but he got back on and uh, he's actually been pretty effective throughout so far. He's done a great job this weekend. Last year here he was very fast. We were a bit unfortunate not to end up on the podium and uh, likes his place, done a lot of laps around here and certainly knows how to get the most out of the car. Well, Stephen Richards has found his worst round of drop. He totally has done that, hasn't he? Yeah, right. When you get out, you're going to get your head down as hard as you can again. Remember, the fuel flow rate for refueling is about four litres per second. And uh, they're 44 laps down out of a 96 lap race, so you can work backwards from the amount of fuel that's going in. And as you know, on these 300 k lap races, you're only allowed to refuel once, which I find a quite a bizarre rule. Ooh, because uh, JB, not cold tyres, but heavy in the back. He probably hasn't screwed enough brake onto the rear of the car yet to get the most out of it. But they've got to make sure they get more than enough fuel in it. As we saw a win, a few of them running out of fuel. You're not allowed to top up. And you, if you get a DNF, you're at the back of the field. So you've got to make sure you get enough fuel in there. And the fuel burn here is about two litres a lap. I mean, it depends on who you talk to, team to team, and the way their engine's configured and what sort of grunt they make. But that, that's a basic average. Not surprisingly, Marcus Ambrose has just posted the fastest lap time of the race, a 111.068. Let's check in with Daryl Beattie. Daryl? We obviously, it's working for him, Matty. I just spoke to Ross Stone. Ross said we're originally going to stick with that plan. The main reason is that they could make an adjustment to the car and really see what advantage they were going to get out of it so they can make some time back on Mark Scape before they go for the fuel. Here's a battle between Jason Bargwana and Greg Murphy. Side by side, Simon Wills is there in car 44. He's already had arguments. You can see the result on his driver's side door, the big dent on the inside. Down to turn six. Inches, centimetres, not enough. Wills, contact with Murphy. Nobody it's harmed in the incident. They it's all maintain their positions and get a level head for the main straight. Greg Rust. Matthew, just to update you on the, the Simon Will situation, he pitted a lap ago, and while they were doing the pit stop, the compulsory fuel stop, they took both front wheels off, made a couple of adjustments, a couple of clicks on the front shocks. Simon mentioned to me this morning that he was worried about the way the team dynamic car would be during the race. Very happy with its speed in the shootout and qualifying, but he just worried about the way it would look after its tyres during the race. That has obviously become an issue. And, and in his qualifying lap yesterday and in the shootout, the car certainly looked very nervous in the rear end. It was pointy. And that was one of the reasons why they managed to squeak it into the qualifying in the shootout. His time right at the end there was a fantastic time. One of the art forms here, Bradley, as you know, is to not only have a car that qualifies well, but one that you can calm down sufficiently so that it races comfortably and looks after its tyres over the duration. Well, and, and what you're saying is 100% correct. I followed Simon around for a couple of laps in the warm-up this morning, and his car does point very well over it. 
turn four, he doesn't use all the road. There's some bumps on the outside there, and he turns in from the inside of that. And a car with a lot of point is what's needed to do that. So then you have to tame it. You have to make it so it's really comfortable to race in. And uh, you know, not many people except for Oscar would uh, pull some front wheels off and adjust the shocks during a race. But that's the sort of edge you need to stay competitive in the class at the moment. Stephen Ellery put fuel in there. He's another who's been bedridden with the flu throughout the week. They did a test and also tested his endurance partner for 2003, Luke Yulden. Here Murphy. comes Ambrose coming flying down the main straight. That was Murphy in the background there too, Matthew. So he's come in and taken service. So both pit stop boxes ticked for Russell Ingle and Mark Scaife. It's tires for Murphy. Pulling out on average one second to let Marcus. So keep working hard, mate, because once we get that fuel in the car, it's not going to be so good. We're going to make it up now. And that's the bottom line, is 100% correct. They need to make hay while the sun's shining. And if he can put a lap on Scaife, can continue to do that every lap. But with that, one thing we don't know, is he putting putting the time on Dumbrell Morris or is he putting the time on uh, Murph, on, on uh, Scaife? I'd suggest it's Scaife, because that's the only one they've got to worry about at the moment. What they're trying and to do is... going to be in traffic. As you pointed out before, Bradley, their, their trick at the moment is they're trying to make as many gains as they can with with a good tyre on a light fuel load. So yeah. there's probably going to be some, well, not probably, there is going to be some speed in that. And the downside of that, of course, is when he gets the fuel in it, he's not going to be able to run quite as fast as Mark Scaife, certainly for a little while. And so then the job is for Mark to try and find his way around him, which is always the most difficult thing to do. And sometimes the tyres don't like that. Daryl? Neil, I spoke to Jeff Gretsch just now on the pit wall and I said to him, why did you guys come in back to back and whack the tyres on now? He said, we had no choice of the way Ambrose went, so maybe you can read into that a little more. I think that says it all, really, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think it does. <laughs> I was just sitting there pondering the answer, but... Uh... <laughs> There's no post. Well, that's exactly the way we picked it. That Marcus has got a extreme pace going out there at the moment. He is uh, still in the 11s. The only bloke on the circuit capable of doing that at the moment. And uh, if he keeps this up, uh, I think Mark will be lucky to even catch him, let alone try and get by him. Well, everything's looking pretty handy for Stone Brothers Racing with Ingle and Scaife both completing their pit stops around about the same time. So they've both got fresh rubber and a full tank of juice. And currently, Russell Ingle is in front of Mark Scaife as Paul Dumbrell now comes in for his first stop of the day. In the uh, fuel reset and the brake bias, would you stop with here, please? A crucial stop. Lap 55, Marcus Ambrose gets fuel on board, and Daryl Beatty is there. Daryl? Yeah, everything going to plan at the moment. One guy down on the left-hand rear tyre checking pressures, Matty, but everything going to plan. Nice, nice stop, and as you know, fuel takes a while. Doesn't it? This will shake it all down. It's just oh, a he wait stole it. See. He stalled in pit lane. Only oh, a oh, and almost contact. Yes, contact in pit lane between Ambrose and Ellery. Are you all clear to exit, Marcus? That's disaster. A stall, a split second stall, and Marcus Ambrose puts. Got it. Well ahead of Skype and um, oh, ahead of Russell and then Skype. Puts his race on the line, and here's the man who's waiting to pounce, along with Russell Ingle. Mark Skype is out there. He was caught in some traffic. We understand while Marcus was doing that stop. But in terms of what's going on in that car happen any better for him what happened to Marcus Ambrose out in front of him is Russell Ingle let's see what's happening and we understand that because of this bang yeah. in pit lane Marcus Ambrose will get a drive-through penalty yeah Bradley and I were just talking about it then and Brad picked it hundred percent right you you, uh, you can't do that you can't just run into somebody in the lane so he's now going to cop a penalty shaking the head from Marcus Ambrose who was so close. Are you sorry about that, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Marcus. Here's Jason Bright comes in. Everything was going to plan for Stone Brothers and Marcus Ambrose. It was picture perfect up until that point. Jimmy Stone grabs the bottom lip. Thinks things are starting to go wrong at the very wrong time. There's Campbell Little. Well, there was a just a sequence of things there. There was the stall, which then puts the driver under pressure. And the rearward vision is bad enough. And he's gone out and... Uh... OK, mate. We went out of TNC so can leave there, eh? It's a shame. And there you go. That would have been the net result. They're saying it would have been a 10-second lead. Back to the 
this is all good news for Russell Ingle. Absolutely. So the battle will focus down to Ingle and Scaife. Well. <laughs> First to blink. And that's what's happened. The tiniest of mistakes. We talk about it on the track being hundreds and thousands of seconds. The most minute details in this sport derail an entire afternoon, an entire weekend. Weeks of testing, hours and hours of hard work from all crews, engineers, drivers. And it comes down to this. Marcus Ambrose in the box seat to make it five straight championship victories, now finds himself in the slowest seat out there. 40 kilometres an hour pit lane. Head down and work your way through the traffic, mate. Drive through penalty. Look of despair from the 26-year-old. I'd have to say that he handled it pretty well. Marcus, this is Gary, hit him, you, I think, and he's just about to go into turn three. You know, he didn't, he just, he, he asked for confirmation of it. They confirmed it, and he's just gone about doing the job, which is what he's got to do. It's, it, there was no carry-on on the radio, and uh, his heart rate stayed under control, so he's just got a job to do now. And that's been the impressive thing about Marcus Ambrose, keeping that heart rate well, where it needs to be. Now let's take a look at what all this means in terms of your race score. And you can see now that Russell Ingle has the race lead 2.07 seconds ahead of Mark Scaife. Take Marcus Ambrose out of that picture for the moment. Then you've got Jason Bright, Todd Kelly, Paul Morris, Dumbrell, who's yet to do both stops. Radisic there in eight. John Bauer still inside the top 10. So a bittersweet moment for Stone Brothers Racing as the favourite at that moment, Marcus Ambrose, trips across the line in pit lane. His teammate, Russell Ingle, fires Beat away. Death, um, 40 laps to go and you're plus two seconds. 2.1 seconds, in fact, over Scape. The enforcer versus the five-time series champion. This will be a good battle. Russell's got some traffic to deal with here. Every tenth counts. We Last asked... time through, it was 12.2 seconds. One 12.2 for both Ingle and for Scape. Which is pretty handsome speed. And Ingle goes through on David Thexton. To turn five. Car 99 gets wired and leaves car nine alone. Russell Ingle. Won it back here in 1999 when he partnered Larry Perkins in the Queensland 500. Scaife got a better run on the uh, Thexton there, so Russell was the net loser in that traffic manoeuvre. A year later, Mark Scaife won it in 2000 when he partnered Craig Lowndes. Eight, seven tenths on him. So 1.38 is the difference now. A 1.12.89 for Russell Ingle that last lap, a 1.12.16 for Scaife. Here's Jamie Wincup in car 33, who's down in 22nd position. The hard charger out of our last round at Hidden Valley. The youngster qualified 29th and moved up to finish overall 20th, but he finished 11th in the third race. And wouldn't this be a moment for Russell Ingle? Remember, he has won a race in the BA Falcon, but not in terms of the championship. You have to go all the way back to the Melbourne Grand Prix that the last lap through for Ambrose, 11.5. He's comprehensively the fastest man on the racetrack at the moment. And Lowndes is pretty quick as well, down in ninth place at 11.9. But he's still third, Ambrose, and that's very, very good car speed. Things just change in an instant, don't they? So, Ingle first as he comes across to complete another lap. Scaife second. Ambrose is there in third. So as Ingle and Scaife attack turn one for another lap, Ambrose comes around on turn six. Still in third position, as Neil mentioned. Jason Bright's behind Michael's him. Leading. Saturday games in the afternoon, Melbourne versus Essendon, of course. Round 18, and then a couple of games in the evening, depending on which market you're in. Check it out, AFL on 10, every Saturday afternoon and night. And 
Don't forget comprehensive wraps in sports tonight, right across the weekend and throughout the week as well. Team Better Electrical moves along and Team Noski, with Mark Noski missing the rear assembly of this car, which was taken off earlier on in the race, now gets Juice on board. So car 23 can tick both the tick uh, pit lane compulsory stop boxes. And Marcus Ambrose is consistently putting down 111s and has now reduced the deficit to be 12.5 seconds behind. He's effectively picking up around about half a second per lap on the guys in front of him. While we're in that break, I was watching the timing monitor and Marcus was consistently doing 111.6s or 111.5s. And Russell Ingle and Scape are both doing low 112s. But on the road, when you see it, in terms of meterage, boy, that's a long way. Looks like a pad change, change going on with Jason Richards. Neil, that's spot on. I, I actually can't believe what's going on here, and I don't think uh, Jason can either. He's sort of shaking his head. There has been some deliberation about this problem down here at Team Dynamic for a few laps now. They were sort of arguing whether, I guess, to bring him in. There's the, the disc looks incredibly scored as well on the front right here, but they are changing the pads on car 45. I've also just ducked next door to the Sierra May Wines team. Paul Morris banking some good times in that brand new VY Commodore at the moment. And both Nigel Barclay and race engineer Paul Sepernich gave me the thumbs up. They said the car is good, but I guess I'm wondering why he's uh, maybe not a little further up the order. The answer to that may, may be in his slow pit stop for tyres. They had dramas with the front left. It took much longer to get the wheel nut off the front left on Morris's car. Perhaps he could be higher than where he currently is. They're squeezing um, the caliper pliers there. It's suggests they're going to do a pad change. And if it's got scores on the road of Bradley, it suggests that it might have run out of pad material. Quite possibly. They must have a terrible wedging problem or something because you just don't do enough laps around here in 300 k's to wear out a set of pads. And it's not noted as being particularly hard on pads. We are taking a look at 34 and 15, which is Garth Tander, who's in position number 11. And Rick Kelly is coming up as position number 12. So that battle's been going on for quite a while. In front of uh, Garth is Rick's teammate, Greg Murphy. Check out your website, v8supercar.com.au, especially in the lead up to the Enduros at Sandown and Bathurst. That's where you'll find all your driver pairings. And here's Paul Morris that Rusty was talking about he's in fifth position at the moment. He was a beneficiary of a little bit of bump and grind between Todd Kelly and Jason Bright that effectively put Todd Kelly in fourth position and Bright back to sixth. And in the movement that happened, Paul Morris snuck in and claimed fifth as well. Not a lot of difference in pace between these two. This is uh, Morris has had some good showing so far this year. They've certainly turned that team around from where they were last year. They've made a lot of personnel changes, and they, they, even though this is their test track, at a few of the other events, he's uh, showing that he's got a fair bit of car speed going this year. Well, so uh, he hasn't hasn't been out of the top ten all weekend at various practice sessions, qualifying, and so on. So he's had a, a good strong run this weekend. Ambrose versus Scape is third versus second. And look at that, the last five laps, 76 down to 72, inclusive, have all gone Marcus's way. In fact, lap 76 was eight tenths of a second better. This is better pace in this stint of the race than Marcus showed in the first stint. And Bradley, I suspect that they made an adjustment to that car in the last stop. Well, we he's moved. See. Yeah, I, I'd say they did a roll centre adjustment. They just certainly didn't have time to do anything to the shocks when they had the wheels off the car. That was a fast stop, and they didn't do it again go, when, they, uh, when they did the fuel. So I'd say they've done a roll centre adjustment, and the car has liked it. He's certainly got a fair bit of pace. Uh, he's driving calmly. He's not angry. So uh, he's done a fantastic job. That car looks very fast. He's driving the wheels off the thing as well at the moment, just sliding it here and there, but not lurid slides. You can see the car's being pressed, he's but got not pressed lock. out of shape. Yeah, he's got missile lock on that thing escapes. You can see in his eyes, you yeah. know, they're continually telling him the gap. It's coming down, that gives you confidence. He's squeezing on the throttle, he's not overreacting. 
doing a very good job and it's very purposeful. Look at the way he's holding himself in the car. He's very focused on what he's doing, paying attention to the things around him. Making a lot of bar adjustments on that car and I sort of suspect if you watched him on board for a whole lap, you'd see bar adjustments in various spots around the track. Lowndes used to do that around here as well. Absolutely. When your car is, is close to being right, you're trying to get the most out of it. What he'll do is he'll pull the rear bar up for one and two, I'd say. Then, uh, or sorry, pull it back down so it's not so tightly. Then pull it up so it turns better in the second and third gear corners in the midsection of the circuit. Speaking of Lowndes, the siege continues between the Cat Ford and the Aussie Mail Ford. And the battle there is for ninth and eighth position. Greg Rust in pit lane. Well, Matty, I'm with Craig's former engineer, Oscar Fiorinotto. Can you tell us what happened to those brake pads? They were absolutely eaten out on Jason Richards' car. Why would that be? Uh, well, Rusty, what happened? Uh, look, Jason had a bit of an altercation early on with one of the cars. Unfortunately, it's damaged some of the ducting, which has caused the brake to go overheat, and hence the excessive brake pad wear. Hard luck. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks. Back to the race between Lowndes and Bow. And uh, that's Radisic for a position just in front of them, so uh, they'll all be going pretty hard here. Seventh, eighth, and ninth. There's Radisic in seventh, Bow in eighth, Lowndes in ninth. Times comparative are leading the way, lending a helping hand to Craig Lowndes. Four out of the last five, the one that he missed. Here's a move. He's not going to get him there at turn three. Will he get him on the inside? He won't get around him there, let me tell you. John Bow drifts wide now up to turn five. Side by side. This will be turn four, in fact. It's got the left hander. Aggravation potential, hasn't it? Hasn't it? What? Yeah, it's going to be disaster written all over it. Lowndes has a look on the inside. Now turn five. Shoots down to six. This has been a great battle. Between the 1995 series champion, John Bow, and of course, three-time series champion, Craig Lowndes. And Radisic will be enjoying this. If you look in the mirror going, oh, thank God those two are going at it because they're not getting close enough to attack me. And JB will be trying to block Lowndes out, but not knock too much pace off, because if he can get into a battle with Radisic, it's going to make it even tougher for Craig. So they're all, of course, being a bit careful because there's only 16 laps to go, but you always want to get that extra position. Incidentally, on the back of that little train is Dean Cando. We saw he had a loop early on in the race, but he was stranded with a jammed gear lever. And he's lost a bunch of laps in what was otherwise a pretty strong showing. He qualified very well this weekend, very close to that of his teammate. Further restoring his confidence certainly after he am. was put on notice at uh, Darwin. Yeah, which certainly doesn't, help from a race drive, car driver's point of view, does not help you at all. And uh, you know, it's nice to know that you're going to get to the end of the season in the job that you got. I think he drives very well. What people don't realise is to get into this class, the competition ramps up immensely from the Konica series. Look at all the ex Konica guys that are in here, and it's just taking them a while to find their feet. And that's because. It's a, uh, it's a tough, tough business, so I'm glad that uh, John Briggs has decided to give him an opportunity to run to the, to the end of the year, because he's a good little steerer. Dino you know, made his V8 supercar debut here in 1999 at the Queensland Raceway, and as Bradley mentioned in the Konica Series, he took out that series, the inaugural Konica Series in 2000. Back to business for Marcus Ambrose, makes a quick adjustment in the cockpit down the back straight. You can see he's just what he's done there is he's taking a little bit of rear brake off the car. So just squirting a little bit of front brake on it. He's probably chewed through, you know, I don't know, 20 litres of juice or something. Every uh, 15 to 20 litres, probably someone will come on the radio or he'll know. Just pull a little bit of rear brake off the car so it's uh, uh, get a bit more on the front. Getting a bit lighter at the back, you want more braking power at the front. We'll keep the car balanced. And if you don't do that... If you don't do that, the cars can be prone to locking the rear brakes, then you skid into the corner and you make yourself prone to a spin. Exactly. So you run as much rear brake as you can get away with in these cars, and then you just sort of go, OK, it's locked, let's just go half a turn forward from there. Stone Brothers Racing talking to Marcus. They've got a list, a lineup for him to tick off as he goes around the closing stages of this big Pond 300 and tries to reel back the disaster that happened in pit lane, effectively put him in this position. Next on the list is Anthony Tratt, the back marker. There he comes now at 75, a little bit loose. And that is Marcus's target for now. But the real target is Mark Skate. And those last five yeah, laps Ambrose, continue mate. to be green for Ambrose. It's got nail biter potential. We're 81 laps in, 96 lap race. He continues to churn out 11s. I don't think I've seen him, other than maybe some spot traffic here or there. He's constantly been in the 11s. Even the last lap was an 11.9. Here's John Bow putting the move on Paul Radisic down at turn three on the inside. JB gets him. 
Well, that, that's Just why Craig Louds too. <laughs> <laughs> Will Louds hold that position? Yes, he does as well. So Bow gets seventh, Louds gets eighth, and Radisic goes back to ninth. Look, I can be JB's Arthur Daly and uh, up his fee by another 10% now, uh, if you like. Yeah, listen, I'm having trouble feeding the family as it is. <laughs> What's interesting about this dice itself, well, the, the, the dice was, oh, JB down the inside of Lowndes. Must have had a bad run out of that hairpin. And he's going to have Lowndes all over him, whether he likes it or not, till the end of this. Craig was really comfortable when I saw him just before the start of the race about the way his car was behaving as a race car. He, uh, he felt like uh, it was going to be a good settled car and he get plenty out of it during the afternoon and it's proving to be the case. Listening to, to what you're saying, Marcus. 14 to go, Marcus. 14 to go. Keep it clean, pass track. Keep it clean. Hopefully Anthony Trader let Marcus by here. Yep, early break there. Marcus is down the inside. Now what's interesting just in front of this piece of action is Mark Scaife hasn't been able to get past Stephen Elry, which suggests that the pace just isn't quite there. You see them in front of him. Elry has maintained that gap to Scaife. So uh, there's no doubt that Marcus will be hunting him down. Now, what could be going on here is the, the, uh, the air pressure adjustment that they've made with Mark's car hasn't had the, the, the to reaction the, to, to the, the car tires. that they were looking for, to the tyres that they were looking for. 85 laps done. They begin lap 86 of 96. And Marcus Ambrose is now right at the tail of Mark Scaife for position number two on the track in front of them. 3.7 seconds clear of Scaife now is Russell Ingle. Stone Brothers have had their disasters and they've bounced back as Ambrose puts... Got plenty of time, mate. Keep it clean. Two over the edge on the exit of turn two. Someone further up the road had a big lock up into three then. And I think that was actually Russell or someone around him having a bit That's of a right. moment. Because he'll know what's going on. He'll have been told on the radio or he'll see in the mirror that these two are uh, together now and he'll be, uh, he'll be wanting to get out of there quick. What a stellar performance and what a way to bounce back from the disappointment that was thrown at him in pit lane. He's done everything he was meant to do quite clearly. He's got the pace to match it. It's just a matter of can Mark Scaife hold him out? Can Marcus Ambrose get in there and get past him and put Stone Brothers 1-2 on the track. Ten left to go. Ten left to go. So much intense focus in the lead up to this race between these two men. Remember that Ambrose is going for five straight championship victories. Scaife did that last season. Only Jim Richards and Alan Moffat have done five or more in the touring car history. So there's been a lot to play for here. Yeah, everybody's going Burko down yeah. the fence. Yeah, and it's been like on. that for quite a few laps. What's really interesting about this dice when we look at these two cars, Marcus can drive almost anywhere on the track, which is usually what HRT can do. He can roll over a curb, as we see him clip one there, but on the inside, and he can turn in from three quarters of the way out on the circuit, where you watch Mark in front of him is using all the circuit. He's coming over to the apex, he's using almost, well, he's using all the circuit coming out. You watch that car a little bit oversteer on the way out. Marcus has certainly uh, got, a, got a better tool at the moment and he's driving the car really well. And incredibly hard, and Mark Scaife is doing an incredibly hard job there too, holding him out now. But you know, catching Mark Scaife and getting buying are two different things, and uh, he's used to pressure and uh, he'll, uh, he'll be in no rush to let Marcus go by. He predicted to me before this race that it was just going to be one of those good, solid races. It'll be good fun, he said. Well, I don't know if it's fun at the moment, but it's great the for us to watch. The other thing through these two corners, the closer Marcus gets to Mark, as you can see, he's getting away a little bit there. That's because he's losing the air on the front splitter. He's losing some of his aero, so the car is starting to push off the corner. You saw him with the dust up on the outside, so he's got to get close enough that he can have a run at him, but he, he, the closer he gets, the uh, the more air he loses off the front of the car. Oh, that's as close as you can get, Brad. Let's check in with Daryl Beatty. Ross, after what happened earlier, you wouldn't believe that Marcus could have catch Mark Scaife again. Yeah, when he wanted a good call on timing, uh, I thought that was a bit, a bit optimistic, but um, he got his head down. I think he's been pretty hard on his tyres, so whether he can do anything do anything about getting past Scapey or not now, oh. I don't know. Unbelievable car speed, Ross. Yeah, it is. I'm not sure whether um, Scapey's car is good as what it was at the start of the race. I don't know, so time will tell. Thanks, Ross. OK. Right in the cockpit there as we thank Ross Stone and rejoin this battle around turn six. Sets up an intriguing battle at Orange Park. The next round 
in a few weeks' time. You'll see it on 10, 2.30, Sunday the 17th of August. 12.5 on the last lap for Ambrose, 12.6 apiece for both Ingle and Scaife. There's and no doubt that Ambrose is being held up. The interesting thing when you watch is a replay here of Lowndes getting up the inside of your teammate at turn six. And claiming oh position number seven off him. So they've swapped it. And JB leaves tons of space and uh, that's a very intense battle. Oh. Speaking of intense battles, it's interesting to look at the, the speed the that um, Marcus can carry into the corner, Bradley. Yeah. You know, he's really got some great speed on the way. Oh, nudge, look here. nudge, has he got him? Has he got him yeah, up to turn him. four? He's got him. Marcus Ambrose claims the position uh, off Mark Skate. Something, wrong. something wrong. That's yeah. uh, And a big he's, blow. He's oh, an again. There's Two years in a row, engine troubles for Mark Scaife here at the Queensland Raceway. Keep working at it. And Ross Stone said something telling before. He wondered whether these guys had lost some pace relative to earlier in the race. Oh, listen to that. Mark Scaife has put down all sorts of fights and held off all sorts of challenges. And in the end, you've got to listen to this car as it trundles into pit lane. A repeat performance of 2002. Jimmy Richards and Mark Scaife launched an engine at the Queensland 500 and now it appears as though it's happened again. Pretty cruel thing on the oh. 89 laps into a 96 lap race to work that hard with no yield. Yeah. I think though... Can you believe this year? Mark Scaife's words. And it's Mark Scaife I don't think this has affected his earlier pace, though. Frontals in, and it looks as though it's all over there. And, oh, what's happening to Mark Larkham? He's gone deep, really deep, and he's just going to dig himself even deeper. Is that a safety car issue, I wonder? I should think so. Could he's be. off at turn two. He's just gone straight ahead between one and two, and uh, he's a long, long way from oh, wait, wait. anywhere where I've seen people before, so it may not produce the safety car. There he Isn't is. It? That's it. He is in a long way, that's for sure. Well, with only five laps to go. He nearly got it to the grass, you know. Oh, dear, there's the end of Mark Scape. And now it comes down to this. Ingle versus Ambrose. Can Russell Ingle hold on for his first championship win in a Ford Falcon? Has Marcus Ambrose got enough time left to get past his teammate and make it five straight championship victories, whatever? They both hold on to the end. Always going to go, Marcus. You've got a big gap behind you. Just stay cool. Make sure you bring it home. We don't want any incidents now. It's literally win-win for Stone Brothers Racing and Ford once again. And this is a little bit of sugar for Russell Ingle, who got off to a great start at the Australian Grand Prix meeting in Melbourne at the beginning of the year. And then at different stages during the year, luck has deserted him. There's been some strange failures and weird things. The problem off the start line at Darwin, the straight-ahead shunt the end of the start finish straight at Wanneroo but now a big bag full of points and potentially a juicy win for him. The sun smashes through the right hand side but the enforcers very can't up nine. he does and he also looks very trim, very fit, very focused. He's really put the hard work in this year and we know for a fact from Ross Stone who's been Speaking to our guys down there in pit lane, there'll be no team orders here. If you're wondering are there any subplots at play... With only three laps to go and four it. seconds between them, I don't think it's ever going to be an issue. Yeah, there's Campbell Little, like Timmy Stone. And remember, they came here last year, Stone Brothers Racing. And three to go, Marcus, three to go. They broke the duck for Ford when David Bernard and Simon Wills crossed the line. It wasn't a good day for Marcus Ambrose in 2002. They ended up finishing fifth with Paul Wheel, but they're going to go back to back. Quite extraordinary, isn't it? This man has had everything thrown at him today, not to mention the overbearing pressure of that PR machine that's been on his back. Can you do five straight? It's the question everybody's been asking him. His answer is, I need to get out there and just race, do what I do and keep the focus on that. 96 laps is what I'm focused on. Here's Todd Kelly. Flying the Holden flag in third position from Paul Morris, Jason Bright. So a little bunch of Holdens there, third, four, fourth and fifth. And Lowndes, Bauer, Radisich, Murphy, Rick Kelly, Paul Wheel, David Bernard, Stephen Johnson, Paul Dumbrell, Stephen Ellery, Cam McConville. 
Jamie Wincup, Bargwana, Baird and Trapp. That's the top 20. Great performance here from Morrison, a season best fourth. Actually, that's probably the best result he's got since he won at Calder a couple of years ago. They've done a very good job with that car this weekend. It's been quick right from the get-go. And uh, Paul was very impressed with the torque and engine performance from the new engine, the Holden Motorsport engine. This is Jason Bright in fifth. Still taking away another big bundle of points. And he looked to be he's driving very smart. He looked to be struggling there for a little while, especially when Kelly and Morris were on him. And uh, even though there was a bit of elbowing go on, he let them go and he's just kept his head down and he consistently keeps on grabbing the points, so which makes him a, a definite outright contender. Someone's got a bit of your disease out there. It sounded like a broken header on one of those cars. Very noisy, something that went past us there in the last few seconds. You mentioned Jason Bright. He'll walk away with 168 more points. JB, by the way, has had that left indicator on for around about 95 laps now. And we understand, don't forget, we'll update you at the end of this, but we understand that Marcus Ambrose will move up to second in the championship and start getting closer to Jason Bright. The difference will be about 30-odd points. Paul Radisic looks as though he's got a problem. Car 65 in eighth position. Well, Greg Murphy's gone around him like he's standing still. One of the Valvoline cars was limping, and we know that Tander's out, so it must have been a wind cup. And uh, Radisic has dropped a second a lap, so he is in trouble at the oh, moment. Oh, oh no, there, there goes go. David Thexton. Thexton in a puff of smoke. Goes Thanks. round after being helped along the way by Greg Murphy. Remember Thexton down in 23rd position. And Murphy goes shooting on pass, so he's got past Paul Radisic up to eighth. The gap between Russell Ingle and Marcus Ambrose as the Ford flags begin to fly proudly is 3.4 seconds on your final lap. Terrific and performance. Russell Ingle comes around, turn three. Marcus Ambrose follows him. What an extraordinary day's racing. The last time that Russell Ingle stood on top of the podium was Winton 2001 in his days as a Holden driver. Remember, he did win at the Melbourne Grand Prix a non-championship round. He was pumped for that one. But I guarantee you that this will be the sweetest victory of all for Russell Ingle. His first in a BA Ford Falcon. And he will lead an extraordinary sweep for Stone Brothers Racing. The Enforcer returns to the top of the podium. A one right, two passage, for Stone Brothers Racing. Marcus Ambrose second. Todd Kelly third. Boy, sir. Sorry, I couldn't do five out of five for you. I bet you there is a motion like never before inside that cockpit because Russell Ingle so dearly wanted this win and Stone Brothers go side by side for a victory parade lap. Uh, mate, you know, um, obviously you know you're going to come down here to pit lane and uh, line up under the tower. That's Campbell Little talking to Russell Ingle. That's a very, very popular victory for the Enforcer, who's switched camps for 2003. He's worn it on the chin, and it's thumbs up from a fellow Ford mate in Stephen Johnson. What a day, the Big Pond 300 has been nothing but ecstatic for Stone Brothers Racing. Once again, one of those days full of heartbreak and bad luck for Mark Scaife and Holden Racing Team, although Todd Kelly manages to get on the podium in car number two. A wonderful performance and result for Paul Morris. Jason Bright continues to bank up the points. Craig Lowndes finishes in sixth. John Bow in seventh. Greg Murphy in eighth. Rick Kelly there in ninth. And Paul Wheel rounds out our top 10 performance. David Bernard in his new BA Falcon finishes 11th. Then it's Johnson, Dumbrell, Ellery, McConville, Wincup. We'll go all the way through the field for you. Barguana Baird, Anthony Tratt in 19th. Jason Richards didn't Team Dynamic have their troubles. So too did Mark Noski. Canto, Thexton, Max Wilson. Quite a few laps behind, but the story of the day, Russell England. Well, this is certainly one time when Russell Ingle and Marcus Ambrose would not mind being called 
Pineapple heads after taking out the Big Pond 300. Engel and Ambrose make it an SBR 1-2. Of course, they drink milk at the famous Indy 500 here in Queensland. They suck on a bit of pineapple juice when they claim the victory. Let's take a look at how they finished for top 10 points for the championship from today. And Russell Engel gets 192. Ambrose puts 186 in the bank. And Todd Kelly gets 180 points. Another top 10 finish for Paul Wheel out of Team Brock. As far as the championship pitcher goes now, at the halfway mark of 2003 championship, Jason Bright continues to lead, but Marcus Ambrose is moving ever so close. Ingle moves up to fourth, but look at Mark Skate, stuck down there in seventh position. Well, that's it for now. We hope you enjoyed the coverage of the Big Pond 300. Quite an extraordinary day's racing.